belum orang Hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello. Uh, which one? This is the Kobe shield. So I guess it is the here in the, the Pune there is this what is it called? Ceramic. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, great. How's uh, how's everything in the department, by the way? Going good, going good. So uh, let's see, let's see how things go. <laughs> so are you, are you like working from home I see or how does it work? I mean is it uh, people are coming to the campus? Yeah, I mean until last week it is like almost becoming normal. Mm, yeah, like, you know. So 
we had all you know quite a bit quite a few of students i guess you know probably like 70% of students in campus about 2 weeks ago but you know right now i don't know what's the status hmm. i mean this is going to take you know every time there's a peak it takes couple of months or 2 to 3 months to get stabilized so it's a, it's a long haul yes yeah Yeah. Well, well, I guess we'll just have to live with it, right? Yes. So, Varun, you can keep uh, an eye on the other things. Time? Yes, it's still a couple of more minutes. Yeah, sure. I see Gaurav joined. Have you met Gaurav? Karshik? Uh, I think so, yes. Uh, yeah, we met, uh, I, I met Gaurav. I think I visited, uh, well, I just stopped by IIC, I think, a couple of yeah. years ago. And I had a conversation with uh, Gaurav at the time. How are you, Gaurav? Hi, Koshik, how are you doing? <laughs> yeah, good, very good. How about yeah. everything? Good, good. Uh, just uh, too many things going on. <laughs> I just saw the LinkedIn news about the Qualcomm Faculty Award. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Koshik, are you standing up for some reason or? Yeah, sometimes I stand up in a re- uh, I mean, you know, I'm just getting bored with sitting in a chair for all the time. <laughs> so I, I've, I've got a, like a standing desk uh, with me. Um, so I try to, you know, stand half of the time. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's interesting because I have another colleague here that I work very closely with in aerospace. Mm. And he also has a standing desk, so that's, that's an interesting setup. I understand it's much more healthy. Yeah, I mean, it's it's better than sitting down, right? <laughs> I don't know how well they did just standing up. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that's... Uh, I, I actually also got a standing desk in my regular office. Like, even in pre-COVID days, uh, I still have a standing desk. Um, but for talks, I typically... Uh, yeah, it's, it's better that way. Hello. Okay, uh, shall we get... Kaushik, you're okay, right? We yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I'm okay. Okay. Should I share the slides or let's see? One uh, second. Let me introduce you. Then. Uh, so I, I would like to welcome all to this uh, uh, ECE webinar. And today we have Professor Kaushik Sen Gupta with us uh, giving the talk, and he's an associate professor at uh, the Department of Electrical Engineering at Princeton University. And before that, he completed his B.Tech and M.Tech from IIT Kharagpur and M.S. and Ph.D. from uh, Caltech. And he's uh, received several awards, uh, for example, the Bell Labs uh, Prize and Young Investigator Program Award from Office of Naval Research, DARPA Young Faculty Award, and so on. And he's also in the steering committee and editorial boards of many uh, uh, IEEE journals and so on. Uh, so with that uh, introduction, I would give it to Kaushik Sen Gupta, uh, and he will will be right. and a quick uh, house rule if you have any questions you can either raise your hands or post it in the chat box and we will take it at the end of the webinar right. thank you very much so Kaushik. all right uh, thank you uh, thank you Raghunathan, uh, for the wonderful introduction uh, and the uh, invitation as well uh, let me try to share my slides here let's see so i should probably share the desktop window And let me know if this is visible. Thank you very much. So, All right. Uh, is this visible? Yes. Okay, excellent. So, um, again, uh, thank you for uh, the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to present the work, even though it would have been better to be at ISCC. Um, I have to say that um, I've, I, I spent a summer in ISC uh, with Dr. Vinay when he just started. Uh, back in 2004, I think, and uh, I was a second-year undergraduate student at the time, and that was actually the first research project I've ever done, uh, and I think we were working on 
uh, fractal antennas uh, at that point, and uh, we got some papers out of it, and uh, it was it was really fun and enjoyable, and um, you know, a lot of small things lead to decisions that you take later in life, and I think that even that internship that I did uh, over that summer in 2004 was instrumental in, in thinking about, uh, you know, electromagnetic circuits and uh, sort of pursuing research uh, in the future. So I would like to thank Dr. Pinoy for that opportunity. So with that, I will I will get started. And, you know, the title of the talk is uh, Chip Skelter Herd Systems. And, um, you know, uh, what I would like to do in this particular talk is, is uh, provide an overview of some of the approaches we have been thinking about uh, in these frequency ranges, particularly at frequencies above 100 gigahertz, right? So here, what I'm going to define terahertz is loosely about frequencies uh, 100 gigahertz, 300 gigahertz. Um, um, uh, in optics, they define it as above 100. In microwave, we define it above 300. So I'm going to loosely define, it, you know, the range of uh, frequencies above 100 gigahertz, uh, and particularly because some of the approaches are sort of translatable across the, uh, the frequencies as well. So here I'm probably preaching to the choir. There's a lot of interesting applications opening up above 30 gigahertz. You know, the 5G phone's already out. I have one of them. It has 28 gigahertz phased array chips, as well as 39. Um, and so, you know, the, the applications range essentially from communication um, to sensing and imaging, right? So um, what would you get by moving frequencies above 100 gigahertz? You get better resolution, higher... Uh, uh, um, better resolution um, in many cases. So there's um, UAV drones and so on and so forth, right? So from the sensing side, there's also interesting applications in uh, in sort of gesture recognition. So you can see the uh, the GIF uh, file below. That's uh, a Google Solly project where they use a 60 gigahertz uh, radar. Um, to pick up, you know, sort of tiny uh, motions of your fingers, and you can do that because you move to 60 gigahertz with a wide bandwidth enough that keep, can give you the, um, you know, sort of depth resolution bandwidth here, right? So, um, so there's a lot of interesting applications in that frequency. This is sort of a higher frequency, the security image that we show here, which is uh, um, uh, the NASA uh, 675 gigahertz imaging system. I've actually seen that system in JPL. It's pretty large. Uh, but it can actually do, you know, sort of scan-based imaging uh, from around 20, 25 feet away, away from that individual. So there's a lot of interesting applications uh, in that in those frequency ranges as well for sensing and imaging. And partly this is also because of the fact that, um, you know, things like autonomous um, uh, cars, AR and VR applications are going up. And so, you know, th there is a necessity for high bandwidth connectivity uh, for communication. Now, um, you know, 5G is not all about millimeter wave. There is also sub six gigahertz 5G. And, you know, but the, uh, there's, it's, there, there is an understanding that that is also a very important part of the whole system, even though that spectrum is very, very expensive. So for example, um, you know, in January of this year, the 5G spectrum in the C band um, was auctioned, and you know it's essentially around 160 million dollars per megahertz in USA, um, and and the numbers are very similar in in India as well. So you know this is an expensive spectrum. So there is a you know there is a obviously in addition to the low frequency, there is a need to move towards higher frequency spectrum uh, above 28 and 39, where the spectrum per megahertz, where the cost per megahertz is much much cheaper. So in terms of communication, um, uh, there's a lot of interest in sort of point-to-point -point lengths, right? So that could be between UAVs. This was a DARPA project for 100 gigabit per second lengths over 200 kilometers. Um, so they, they didn't use uh, frequencies above 100 gigahertz. They used millimeter wave around 60 to 70 gigahertz as well. Uh, but you can imagine the rates here, right? 200 kilometers, 100 gigabit per second. And so if you can do those kind of links, you know, wireless backhaul also becomes interesting, right? So there's a lot of interest in, in getting, um, you know, millimeter wave wireless uh, backhaul links as well. Uh, Nokia is working on it, uh, even above frequencies above 100 gigahertz here. Now, one of the fundamental ideas or are, are some foundation building blocks of millimeter waves and higher frequencies is arrays, uh, antenna arrays. And I'm loosely defining as antenna arrays, which could be phased arrays or MIMO arrays or hybrid arrays or and so on and so forth. But the idea is 
you have to make multi-beams, focus multi-beams, uh, to be able to electronically scan them, right? So that makes it sort of different from lower frequency, sub-6 gigahertz radio frequency that is more omnidirectional, and the scattering properties are very, very different. Now, the idea of phase arrays has been there for a long time. It's not a new thing. I mean, uh, defense systems use phase arrays uh, uh, for generations. Um, you know, but the fundamental difference between you know these kind of arrays with the kind of arrays that commercial industries are thinking about is basically how you make them. Um, if you think about you know the, even the X-band you know phased arrays that uh, Raytheon makes in uh, F-18 uh, fighter jets, that basically based on gallium arsenide TR modules. So you take these TR modules. Uh, as one element, then you connect, uh, you know, uh, switches uh, isolated to the antennas, and you can sort of assemble a large-scale phased array. Only the, ex the expand, uh, the ex you know, the, the cost of making these phased arrays is predominantly very, very high, and that's partly because the solution is not integrated, right? So you have gallium arsenide chips um, that you know amplifier or phase shifter that you have to make with PCBs, and you know, each module is expensive, and so the whole module is also becoming very, very expensive. And so the idea is that, you know, can we move for certain application uh, in the commercial industry from this kind of approach to a more integrated approach? And, you know, people have been thinking about silicon phase arrays, you know, for, for some time now. Even in the defense industry, uh, you know, there is a there is a sort of a move to move from gallium arsenide modules to a silicon backend. Now, for defense, where you need you know better sensitivity and higher dynamic range of the order of 100 dB, um, there's an idea that you know the idea is that you cannot do everything with silicon because of the noise. So you can have a gallium arsenide LNA up front or a gallium arsenide PA up front, uh, but the rest of the system can still be done with um, silicon ICs. And so that goes back to a uh, lot of effort in sort of hybrid uh, or heterogeneous integration packaging and um, in a wafer scale packaging and so on and so forth. But why is this you know silicon even interesting here? Because of the fact that you know the integration levels are are to a point where you can pack in a hundred million transistors uh, in one millimeter square. The latest iPhones now pack in around 150, 130 to 150 million transistors per millimeter square uh, chips. Um, and in volume production, that's like a dollar. And so this is the idea, this idea, you know, the idea of transistors are almost free of cost. Um, and you can pack in so much high density transistors have essentially allowed us to make computing, AI computing, you know, GPUs and so on and so forth. But it's also translated into radio frequencies. Uh, predominantly um, at radio frequency, almost all RFICs are now silicon in the phones that we use, except the PA, um, but also in millimeter wave frequencies. And that has been there for a long time. Uh, these are some of the earlier works of millimeter wave PAs um, and across several groups. Uh, you know, back in 2004 and six, people were looking at you know 24 gigahertz phase arrays, 77 gigahertz phase arrays. Um, uh, Berkeley, uh, the, the, one of the first earliest uh, sort of commercial silicon-based uh, phase array company, Cybeam, came out of Berkeley effort around 60 gigahertz back in 2006, 2007. Uh, so there's been a lot of effort in the silicon community on sort of commercializing silicon phase array. Um, the, the, the chip I showed you on the Google that's using now is basically one of the chips from uh, Cybeam, um, which was later acquired by another company. So, you know, actually one of my one of my PhD thesis research, I mean, at least part of what PhD thesis research was also looking into frequencies above 300 gigahertz. So uh, at that time, we demonstrated the first, uh, I would call that, you know, terahertz phased array uh, on chip. It was a four by four um, element array fully integrated in silicon uh, ICs operating between 280 to 300 gigahertz. This was in, back in 2012. So while that has happened, the idea is that you can make sub elements uh, with silicon ICs and you can sort of uh, make larger scale arrays uh, with, with these to be unit tiles elements. So the application is not just terrestrial, it's also um, you know, SPAT satellite and there's a lot of work happening in uh, across the world uh, in sort of satellite connectivity. Um, you know, this is actually a Starlink uh, 
you know, a terminal with a phased array and, and the sort of interesting videos on how they make these things. But you can see the, you know, the back end is essentially silicon ICs, um, which is packaged with very carefully, actually, with uh, the multi antenna systems. And, you know, the sources uh, hacked it, have actually ripped it apart and, and shown how it works um, and to an extent that they can understand it. But, you know, the idea of these large scale arrays are uh, based with unitile elements. Um, at low cost. Because these satellite links are also you need around 1,000 elements or more than 1,000 elements, the cost is not low because you still need that many of chips. So that's still an unsolved problem uh, in many, many ways, uh, that reducing the cost of these arrays. Um, but right now, the approach is, is taking you know, four element arrays or eight element arrays and building large scale arrays with those unitile elements. So that being the background, I'll just uh, you know our work in that space is uh, looking into millimeter wave and terahertz is is definitely one part of it, uh, but that's not the only thing that we do. Uh, we essentially work from anywhere from 30 gigahertz to almost 3,000 gigahertz for various different um, things. So the millimeter wave terahertz is one aspect of our work. There is another aspect of our work that we look at sort of uh, diagnostic. It's medical diagnostics, um, uh, particularly exploiting silicon ICs, uh, both for sort of in vivo sensing like this pill or for point of care diagnostics. And we know how important that is given the uh, COVID situation we are in. Uh, but I'm not going to talk anything about the biomolecular work of it. I will also not talk anything about the millimeter wave side of work of her work because that will, you know, be another one hour talk. Just, just want to focus on frequencies sort of close to 100 gigahertz and above, and the unique challenges um, there lie in. But you know, I have to acknowledge all my students here. This is a little older picture of my students. You can see they're all from all over the world. Um, we are located in uh, Princeton, New Jersey. Um, as you can see, we are all happy people. They're all smiling, so I, I guess they're all happy with the work they're doing. And obviously, you have to acknowledge, you know, most of the work is, is basically done by them. So just a couple of slides on the millimeter work that we're looking at. So if people are interested in that frequency ranges, I'll be happy to talk after the talk. Um, the idea that we have been looking at for a millimeter wave is the following. You know, if you look at how the bands are developing from 30 gigahertz, so 24 to 100 gigahertz, you have, you have a lot of bands opening up at 24, 28, 37, 38, 39, uh, 60, 57 to 71, you know, again, above 80, um, and even close to 90 now, right? And, and so there's a lot of, some of these are licensed bands, some of these are unlicensed bands. And it's quite clear that, you know, spectrum sharing would be an important part of it. So you exploit the spectrum that's available uh, across the multiple bands to be able to, you know, develop the links. Now, and so if you look at the kind of commercial phase arrays that are in cell phones or even base stations, they're typically single band, right? So they would operate at 28 or 39. And now there's work of making one single phase array operate at 28 and 39. What we have been looking at is into how, what are the kind of architectures that allows arrays to operate from 30 to 100 gigahertz? One single front end that operates at that kind of frequency ranges. Um, and why do we need that? Because if you think about like a, just a sort of a cell phone here, and there's a picture on the right hand side, you need multiple modules to have the diversity. So for example, you can see these phase arrays. These arrays are sort of typically four by one. So these, that's why it's linear, it's not square. And they typically lie at the edges. Um, and, and the idea is that you cannot just have one array, because if you hold your cell phone the wrong way, your, your link is gone, right? So you, you need multiple arrays to be able to have the spatial diversity. Now imagine multiple arrays for every frequency that you want to have coverage in. You can imagine, imagine that this becomes non-scalable very quickly. And that's true for the base station side as well. So overall, we have been interested in looking at you know frequency reconfigurable front ends operating from 30 to 100 gigahertz. The challenge is not just broadband circuits. The challenge is also array architectures. Um, and so uh, we have been looking into sort of front-end transmitters uh, that operate uh, anywhere between 30 to 100 gigahertz. And we've been able to cover around 30 to 80 gigahertz now. We haven't still been able to cover 30 to 100, but we have now front-end transmitters that work 
in a programmable fashion from 30 uh, to 80 gigahertz, one transmitter that works across the frequencies. And, and, and these are some of the past works. If you're interested, you know, we have done work in silicon germanium, uh, CMOS, and even indium phosphide, um, some, um, some, some of the latest work that cover these frequency ranges. And so these transmitters are essentially looking at how do you cover these frequency ranges while being spectrally and energy efficient. And for transmitters, that's, a, that's one of the fundamental challenges. But it is not just about broadband circuits. I mean, how do you create any array that work from 30 to 100 gigahertz? If you have antenna arrays spaced at lambda by two, they cannot be lambda by two at across all frequencies, right? So what kind of array architectures that we do? And this was some initial work that we did a couple of a year ago. Uh, the JCC papers, um, uh, the two JCC papers are here. And the idea there was the following, right? The idea there was if I, in classical arrays, you build up arrays with static antennas, and then you have the array factor that you sort of manipulate with. So we were basically saying, well, you, you can do that, but it's not going to it's going to operate a narrow band of frequencies where the spacing is lambda by two. So how do we make something that works across two is to one frequency? So if so, if you space something at thirty seven at lambda by two, it's going to be lambda at seventy three, and you have grading lobes. If you space something at lambda by two at 73, you're going to have lambda by four at 37, and you're going to have strong coupling uh, and lower aperture area. So we were basically looking at, can we still maintain that lambda by two spacing at the lowest frequency and allow element level programmability um, to create different kinds of patterns that you cannot do with static elements? Um, so the idea is that you have still have periodic elements but each element itself has four or five different patterns that you can control electronically. And so this is a way where we are basically looking at antennas uh, that have sort of multiple ports here. This is a single element, uh, and you can actually you know, change the characteristic of the antennas through electronic means. Uh, it may be some level of element level programmability that when cascaded, with array programmability gives you very interesting patterns uh, over a wide range of frequencies. So that's the kind of work that we've been looking at into creating arrays um, uh, operating over multiple uh, multiple frequencies. And there is some new work that's going to come out that looks at it very different, differently. Uh, we are also interested in sensing and imaging. This is a newer work that's a, a work, you know, sort of collaboration with multiple universities where we want to create sort of reconfigurable uh, computational imaging uh, at millimeter wave frequencies uh, with origami uh, tiles. Um, as you, some of you may know that, you know, the space um, antennas that are sent out or even the space solar tiles are often packed in uh, in a very compact fashion and they flare up once they reach the space. So they're, they're very large once they open up, but they're packed with origami foldings. And so the idea there was the following, and we do that for stents as well. So the idea was the following, that can you think about architectures, array architectures, for computational imaging that in addition to frequency time also has the pro ability to sort of program the topology. So you can see that the you know, you can have array architectures as a curve or flat or what have you, um, um, and then that gives you sort of interesting imaging modalities. So that's a, you know, we also pursue sort of microwave imaging and computational imaging and so on and so forth um, at these frequency ranges. But in this talk, I'm not going to talk any of these, but just wanted to give you a sort of background on some of our other work. We use basically going to focus on, you know, how do we enable complex terahertz systems uh, into into sort of single chip systems. Now, given that's the case, it's it's worthwhile to look at what has happened in the community in the last decade. And, and you can imagine that um, you know 2010 to 2020, this this was part of an inflection point in terms of how much work has happened in these frequency ranges. So this is a plot uh, in 2007 from Nature Photonics by Tanauchi that basically shows the idea of terahertz gap, right? Which is basically its power, its frequency, power falling down with frequency. So there's hardly anything operating at these frequency ranges above 300 gigahertz. Uh, the first work in silicon power generation above 300 gigahertz came early 2018. 
2008. Uh, this was from uh, UT Dallas and UCLA that shows um, you know you can make circuits working at above 300 gigahertz, um, but the power levels were tens of uh, nanowatts of power. This is 2018 uh, from a paper that I wrote with some of our co-authors in Nature Electronics, and you can see that the you know the the you know the area is sort of flooded up, right? In the last 10 years, there's a lot of work that happened. And all of these technologies from MMIC short keys to, um, you know, uh, resonant tunneling diodes, all of these power generations have improved. What is remarkable here is, is how silicon has improved from somewhere in tens of nanowatts to hundreds of microwatts or in the milliwatt range. So what really, ha what, what really happened in the last 10 years that allowed us to, you know, create this huge um, impetus in frequency generation or power generation. And it's not because silicon technology somehow has, you know, drastically changed in the last 10 years. You can argue that, you know, the FMAX has hardly improved in the last 10 years. It's, it's basically, we, you know, that community found out ways to optimize power extraction at these frequencies, ability to do combined power, generate power, radiated power, uh, make arrays and so on and so forth to be able to get to that kind of frequency, you know, power ranges. So, you know, at this, at this point we can, you know, silicon can generate like a close to a milliwatt power at half a terahertz and 100 microwatt power at one terahertz. So that kind of power level has already been shown. Now that makes it interesting. Once you get to the milliwatt level of power, you can do interesting things. Um, uh, uh, new, new applications can sort of be in it. So what next? Uh, so, you know, in this paper, particularly, we've been looking at, you know, how do we think about, you know, what are the useful, um, you know, architectures at these frequencies to make it sort of operate in complex environment. And if you think about, you know, the kind of things that autonomous cars do, you know, sensor fusion is a, is a very important thing because all of your sensors are not going to be able to capture the informa relevant information across operating across multiple conditions. So you combine, you know, camera images, lidar images, radar images to get a complete information across the spectrum, because electromagnetic wave behaves very differently across the spectrum to get a complete image of uh, of your environment. And so what we were basically trying to uh, say in this paper is that you know, to be able to make these uh, applications uh, feasible at terahertz, you know, there is need to be able to, you know, allow reconfigurability um, in these terahertz interfaces and not just make something at 300 gigahertz and not just make something at, you know, uh, a particular frequencies uh, because their information would be limited. And so that's a challenge, right? It's hard enough to generate power at these frequencies, but how do you actually generate you know, interfaces that are actually reconfigurable. So what do I mean by reconfigurable? If you think about fundamentally, what, what does a terahertz source do or a terahertz sensors do? At the end of the day, there's either synthesizing down fields, electromagnetic fields, or they're sensing some electromagnetic fields. Uh, and so uh, by reconfigurability, I mean reconfigurability across all the properties of the electromagnetic so for a source, it would be the field, the spatial field distribution in space. So you can think about beam forming in the far field and, uh, you know, near field programmability for near field imaging, uh, polarization and spectrum. These are the three properties of electromagnetic fields. So if you have the ability to program either the source or the sensor across all the properties of spatial field distribution, programmable polarization, and spectrum, you're basically getting close to the what we call the universal terahertz interface, right? And I think that once you are able to do that, you're basically going to close the terahertz and application gap, which one can, you know, um, I mean, which there still exist. I mean, we don't still have applications, uh, you know, commercial applications yet uh, at frequencies above 100 gigahertz. So what's the challenge? The challenge is that your transistors are not very good at this frequency. So what we show here is the plot of Fmax across different energy nodes. So you can see that, yeah, you know, in the indium phosphide HEMS and indium phosphide HBTs are already above one terahertz, which essentially means that you can amplify signals above one terahertz. But, you know, silicon CMOS is not that high, right? It's sort of in the 250, 300 gigahertz range. Silicon germanium HBTs are now doing much better, you know, going close to 500 gigahertz, and now there is effort to make it even 750 gigahertz and above. 
So if you think about you know silicon CMOS transistors in in terms of Fmax, it's it's good to be able to generate power at frequencies beyond Fmax, right? It, it cannot amplify any signals of Fmax. And so how do you you know build up any systems with with devices that are inherently that weak? Um, and and this is what I tell my students, and, and it's sort of it's it's you know tell with the that's the kind of thing we do in the silicon community is that if I compare devices from 3.5 indium phosphide, and we just did some tape outs in indium phosphide, so I, we have a very good understanding how that chip technology works. If I compare an indium phosphide device or a 3.5 device with silicon, it's really, it's not even a comparison. Indium phosphide are much better uh, compared to silicon. So that's the kind of a you know, comparison, I would say. Um, and, and so the idea is that if I want to make systems operate efficiently at these frequencies, um, this is a losing battle. But the point of silicon is integration. So the approach is how do you get many of these transistors or many of these devices work harmoniously to generate maximum power or extract you know, maximum information from, from a sensor interface through a distributed approach. And so what we're going to present today is some of these distributed approaches um, where we still make these interfaces very highly programmable, highly efficient, uh, but with weak transistors. And so this is what we have been thinking on for a while, which is if you think about any kind of a radio frequency transceiver design, design, right? So we combine elements in the electromagnetic space with elements in the circuit space. So if you think about, you know, what are the elements we use in electromagnetic space, you know, inductors, capacitor, transmission lines, antennas, and so on and so forth. And there's a bag of circuit elements, amplifiers, mixers, things of that nature that we combine together to create a system. And what does the system do? Well, if it's a transmitter, it, it you know, transcribes information into radiating fields. If it's a receiver, it extracts information from incident radiating fields. So I have to basically connect electromagnetic fields with information or information to electromagnetic fields. But is this the only way to do that? Are the, the idea of, of breaking the system into multiple circuit blocks and connecting them together, are there other approaches to do it? And so you know, we will try to show that um, in many cases, it often doesn't make sense to, uh, at least at these high frequencies, where individual blocks are not very efficient to think about optimizing individual blocks and connecting them together. And are there other ways of you know, bridging the information to fields and fields to information rather than you know, single port antenna connected to receiver, connected to filters, and, and, and so on and so forth. So we'll try to you know, uh, you know, provide some approaches here. And what is the fundamental approach here? The idea here is the following. You know, at frequencies above 100 gigahertz, um, this is a unique spectrum because this is the only frequency range where the chip size becomes comparable to the wavelength size. Um, if you think about 100 gigahertz, the wavelength is 3 millimeters. 300 gigahertz, the wavelength is 1 millimeter. Your chips are of the order of 1 to 3 to 5 millimeters. And so this is the only you know, spectrum which is sort of interesting because now your chip size becomes comparable to the wavelength. At radio frequencies, your wavelength is much larger than the chip size. At photonic frequencies, your wavelength is much smaller than your chip size. And so when the chip size becomes close to the wavelength, your sort of interesting scattering and radiating properties can emerge. And the and what I'm not saying is that you take an antenna and just miniaturize and put it into the chip. I'm saying that there are new ways of, of using this sort of space where if I want to synthesize an electromagnetic fields or if I want to sense an electromagnetic fields, you can think about radiating surfaces on the chip itself, which is closely co-designed with the circuits. And that radiating surface might look very different from classical uh, you know, sort of uh, static antennas that are connected to electronic transceivers. And so we'll try to show some new design spaces emerging through this co-design of radiating surfaces with deep sub-wavelength electronics. And how can we leverage this interesting dimension where the chip size becomes compiled to the wavelength size? And because now you can have active devices that you can sort of program and control, you know, presumably you can create 
or sense any electromagnetic fields on the fly. So how do we map that to their design architecture? I'll try to provide you know, some examples of this. Okay, so um, you know, uh, I, I'll talk about uh, this approach in two dimensions, one on sensor side of things and one on uh, terahertz sources and metasurfaces side of things. So let me show you some terahertz um, sensors that we did um, in our work. Now, this was some of the earlier work. This is this is a work on all silicon terahertz imaging that we did um, back a few years ago, 2015. Um, and the idea there was, you know, can we sense, you know, incident fields at these higher frequencies, right? Um, at that point, it was not very clear we could do that. And so this is a chip that has 16 elements, a 4x4 array, with integrated antennas. Um, and it's a 4x4 pixel of a non-coherent um, imager at uh, operating around 300 gigahertz. Uh, this was done in silicon germanium, and uh, the way we package it is we take, you know, take the chip. Again, this was fabricated in a commercial foundry, IBM, at that point. Uh, we um, put it on a transparent tape because the incident field is on the left-hand side, or it's coming from the back side. Now, because it's a, these antennas are on chip, uh, you can now think about interesting interfaces to control what the radiating surface looks like. Um, it is not a 50 ohm interface. Uh, it is directly co-integrated with the detectors. And so now you can have this extra flexibility of designing these surfaces that has ele interesting electromagnetic properties. So one example here is, um, you know, these chips substrates are thick enough, so around 200 microns. And so you can you know, excite surface waves uh, if you're not careful. And so what we did here was um, we analyzed what the surface waves might be. And the, uh, the loop was essentially designed to cancel the TE mode on one side within the loop. And with multiple loops, we cancel the transmagnetic modes, which is also the surface wave mode on the other side. So if I now have one of these elements, an array of these elements, you cancel all these surface wave modes, which are the dominant ones, where the TE0 and the TM0. And essentially, you have a very nice radiation pattern coming out from it. So once you have that, you can combine with uh, a source. Uh, we used a commercial source here, but we have also used a silicon uh, transmitter source that I'll talk about later. And then you can do imaging, right? So here we got a tie. We also got a bullet, a knife. Um, how did we get the bullet? Well, you know, US, you can walk into a Walmart and get a bullet. So that's what we did. Um, and uh, we put it together. And this is actually one of the first uh, all silicon terahertz imager, actually, um, with the CMOS source and um, silicon germanium receiver. Since then, we have moved from 300 gigahertz to 3,000 gigahertz. And this was a newer work from 3 to 3.5 terahertz, 100 pixel CMOS camera. Uh, you can see the chip here. Um, the, the chips have pads, uh, which are larger than the antennas inside the chip. At 3 terahertz, the wavelength is so small that the antennas you know, are much, much smaller than the pads uh, of the circuit. So we actually, the via themselves, which is just 10 micron, can be used as a transmission line for matching um, at these high kind of high frequencies. Now, um, they, you can still detect it um, uh, at these high frequencies. It is almost a factor of 10x higher than Fmax, but there is hardly any source at these frequencies, electronic. So what we did, we collaborated with our uh, with uh, with the faculty member at Princeton who works on quantum cascade lasers, and so they generate you know three three and a half, three point two five to three and a half terahertz. Uh, mode locked uh, lasers at, um, well, not really mode, it's a pulse driver um, laser, um, you know, at uh, cryogenic temperatures with, you know, se you know 13 modes at 17 gigahertz spacing. So it's essentially covering 3.25 to 3.5 terahertz. Now, we've combined with electronic sources, uh, photonic sources and electronic receivers, we also demonstrated that you can do imaging um, at these frequencies. But these are not the kind of examples that substantiate the argument that, you know, how are we really exploiting this unique co-design approach? All we have done is, you know, create an antenna, connect a detector, and look at the antenna characteristics. So this is a, so I want to talk a little bit about that idea of sub wavelength and what can we do from it? And so this was also a, collab, uh, a work that we were interested in at the time 
on terahertz spectroscopy. Um, and the idea there was the following, right? So, you know, some gas molecules through intermolecular vibration under low pressure gives you terahertz signatures. And, you know, typically these are broadband spectroscopic signatures that you want to capture. Typically they're done in, you know, photonics domain. And if you look at the terahertz TDS system, pretty large and bulky. What we wanted to do was the following. We wanted to have a spectral estimation or spectroscope from around 100 gigahertz to one terahertz, really large bandwidth, uh, but on chip. Now, if I wanted to do this with the spectrum analyzer approach, I would do the following. I would take an antenna, broadband antenna that can cover the range uh, with a mix it down um, and then you can do ADCs and so on and so forth. The problem here is that to be able to run this mixer, you also need an LO source that will scan the 100 gigahertz to one terahertz. Uh, and for that scan to work, you need multiple LO sources. So no source, electronic source that is locked would cover the gigahertz to terahertz range. And so this approach really doesn't scale with the large range of frequency what we wanted to cover. And so then we started thinking about, are there other ways of extracting information, um, you know, rather than just kind of antenna with a, with a receiver uh, circuit elements. And then this is what the, again, the picture we thought about, which is how do we extract information from the antenna itself, right? The antenna is on chip. You have lots of transistors. Can we just not just connect an antenna with, with the receiver? Are there other something that we can do about it? So the idea was uh, was not that uh, was a simple, which is the fact that you know the current distribution of the antenna surface carries spec spectrum to spatial information, and it is unique by Maxwell's law. So the question is, if I were able to capture the real time dynamics of the terahertz current distribution on the antenna itself, uh, would I be able? to then back calculate what the spectrum of this incident field looks like. Now, if I did that, then I would completely remove all the mixes, all the yellow sources, and the, in the entire spectroscope would be the antenna and the near field detectors. Now, um, in terms of it can be done, now you have to remember that in a spectroscope, you're not hitting with a single frequency, you're hitting with a pulse, uh, which is a repetition frequency. So your incident spectrum is periodic and it is a vector. So what is unknown here is the length is the vector magnitude. So for example, if the incident field is periodic with these harmonic elements, you what you want to do, you want to estimate the contribution of these elements, right? So A1 to AM is unknown. And we show what we showed here is that if I did distribute sensors underneath the antenna, uh, then the sensor information, of course, is related to the spectrum information through a scattering matrix. Now, the scattering matrix is a function of the antenna structure, of the boundary conditions, of the chip size, and so on and so forth. But it is basically a linear estimation at that point. So essentially, what we have, to, what we have done here is you, once the field hits the antenna surface, you can measure the sensor response. You know what the responsivity matrix looks like because it's a scattering matrix that is known. What is unknown is the spectral information, right? So you've basically reduced the linear uh, terahertz wideband spectroscopy problem into a linear estimation problem. And there are lots of uh, algorithms that, you know, uh, that exist uh, allowing you robust estimation. You cannot just invert the matrix because in many cases it's non-invertible. So you have to apply regularization and so on and so forth. The details are in this Optics Express paper, but you know, the other details are in the circuits papers. But here, what we, what was interesting in that these are not high impedance sensors. So it's not, nothing is high impedance at these frequencies. So the idea was not to create sensors which will not perturb the information of the antenna, but co-design of these detectors with the antenna. So as an example, this was the chip. This was a log periodic scattering antenna, which is you know pretty classical, uh, fully integrated on chip. But unlike an antenna, there is no signal coming out from the center. It's completely open circuit. And the black dots represent the near field detectors that is directly interfacing with the antenna. And so the incident field uh, is not just reflected back, it is distributed over the structure and then absorbed by the, by the detectors uh, itself. Now, the question is, how do you, where do you put the detectors? How many detectors? 
Um, what about matching and so on and so forth. So all of the details are in the papers here. But the overall idea is that we would exploit the distributed structure of the antenna uh, for a matching purpose in itself. Um, and the idea was uh, you would put enough detectors uh, to get uh, you know, the harmonic uh, information in space, uh, but not enough such so that the matching becomes uh, problematic. So there was an optimization here. Um, and so this is measurement results from 40 gigahertz to 990 gigahertz. Again, just to remember, uh, you know, uh, just to uh, emphasize the point, the chip does not have any yellow source. So all the chip does is has the antenna, and 84 low frequency sensor response are coming out of it. From that 84 low frequency sensor response, we estimate what the incident frequencies are. Right. So here we measure the from 40 to 990 gigahertz. And this is some subset of results. Even more results are in the paper below. So you can see that we excited, say, you know, unknown frequency of 66 gigahertz based on the sensor response. You can estimate the power and the frequency as well. Um, we, you know, we also excited, say, 918 gigahertz here based on the sensor response. Um, you know, the power here. But you can also see there's discrepancy in the power estimation. There are noise creeping out in the estimation. And those estimation noise essentially depends on the algorithm that you're now using. So it's not just a function of circuit noise that is directly translatable. Because we're using the different kinds of algorithms, including regularizer, non-negative estimation, these algorithms, at the end of the day, is, you know, leads to the noise floor that you see in the spectrum. So we have done this you know, experiments with single frequency, multiple frequency, wideband frequency. And you know, it's obviously not as sensitive as something which is coherent. But there's no coherent you know, spectrum analyzer that can cover this frequency range anyway. So it was, um, in terms of the sensitivity and so on and so forth, it was pretty good sensitivity considering the range of frequencies covered. But the whole chip dissipates less than 10 milliwatt of power as well. So it's a very sort of a low cost uh, you know, implementation in that regard. And then we started thinking about, if I could sense the near field, can I manipulate the near field? And so, you know, the thing about we talked about, which is the programmable terahertz sensor, the idea is that every frequency polarization and angle of incidence would require the optimal modes um, on the electromagnetic surface or um, in optimal current distribution. So we were basically thinking that now if you have sub-wavelength detectors, if I add in a little bit of programmability where, which means that every detector has a little bit of um, impedance control that can control the boundary condition, can I then map this set of boundary conditions to incident field properties? So for example, if I wanted to receive signals at the broad side at 300 gigahertz, you know, can I just map it to an op, you know, optimal detector configuration that will sustain the optimal current distribution? And if I want to you know, uh, you know, receive from an angle, can I then map it back uh, to a different um, boundary condition map, right? And so the challenge here is essentially the mapping itself, right? I mean, how do you create a map that can cover, say, 300 to 990 gigahertz ranges across multiple angles and polarization? But if you could do that, then you essentially have one sensor that is, again, reconfigurable across all the properties of the incident field, which we wanted uh, to talk about. Again, the details are in the Nature Communication paper here. But I'll just show you some examples here. So it, again, this is the classical log periodic antenna. Uh, why we use this? Uh, I don't have, I, you know, I have. We can give you intuition, but there is no theory on this at this point, which will tell you what is the optimal surface uh, we should be using, uh, because we don't use it as a classical log periodic antenna anyway. Um, so you can see the positions of the detectors. Now, now you don't have 84 detectors in this particular case. We have 16 detectors. Each detector has five states. It's basically a switch capacitor circuit. Now, so there's 16 detectors, each with five states. So that's five to the power of 16 states. And that's 152 billion electromagnetic states. And the idea was, how do I map then 152 billion electromagnetic states to the incident field properties across spectrum, angle of incidence, and polarization? Uh, and so this is highly non-convex space. And, and so we ap apply sort of heuristic algorithms here um, you know, randomizing the initial conditions, uh, you know, locally gradient descent, uh, and so on and so forth. But I want to show you some examples uh, that shows the principle of its operation here. 
So as an example, so suppose you have um, uh, the antenna with the sensors, which is a distributed, you know, sensors uh, connected over the antenna surface. And the different colors represent the, you know, five different states, right? So five colors, five states. And there are 16 detectors. The size of the circles represents how much locally the power is absorbed. So the center ones are absorbing more power than the, the edges here. So it turns out that if I did program in this particular state, then it is optimal for broadside reception at 300 gigahertz. If I then use the same you know, sensor, say 750 gigahertz, uh, the radiation pattern is not very good. So the, how do I now change the boundary condition to create the optimal surface modes, uh, sorry, optimal you know, surface current distribution to make it optimal for 750 gigahertz? And it turns out that if you go to finally this state, through multiple non-convex states through that space. Um, in this particular states, uh, you can see that the 750 gigahertz radiation pattern is now optimal and 300 gigahertz is now suboptimal. You can see the colors have changed. You can see the size of the circles have changed. Essentially, you've changed the current distribution uh, uh, on the surface itself. Now, uh, I'm not going to, you know, too many measurement results there, you know, sort of the, in the nature communication paper, but over the 200 to 60 to 1 terahertz range, uh, we see more or less between 5x to 10x enhancement of sensitivity compared to the static case. Uh, and so if you can do it across frequency, uh, you can do it across polarization as well and angle of incidence. So here we have covered minus 45 to plus 45. So essentially, you can bend the beam in multiple directions. But Unlike a phased array, this doesn't have a mixer, doesn't have you know phase control. You're basically creating phased surfaces to be able to be bend the beam. Uh, it's almost like a continuous phased array, uh, if you will. Um, so you can do it across uh, angle of incidence, and you can do it across polarization as well. Um, and so it has very interesting properties in terms of being able to cover a really large range, right? So 260 gigahertz, actually from 100 gigahertz to one terahertz, uh, with uh, angle of incidence being plus minus 45 um, and across both the polarization itself. Now, um, and, and, and the idea was essentially comes from, you know, this idea of a, you know, distributed radiating surface with sub wavelength uh, field manipulation. And so I will try to show this on the so source side of things. I mean, how can you think about the same ideas of programmability on the source side of things? So this is, um, let me just try to wrap up in the next you know 10 minutes on that is you know we when we discussed the terahertz phase array work you know we were thinking about what is the optimal surface current for a terahertz phase array now you have a chip you can analyze the modes in the chip of electromagnetic modes in the chip and you know, one is a radiating mode there are multiple surface wave modes and so what you want to do is you want to optimize the surface current right that will maximize the radiative modes and minimize the surface wave modes uh, that you might have. And it turns out that given the substrate thickness, uh, you can analyze that. And you know, sort of traveling wave loops, multiple of them, with some distinct spacings, um, can really lead to very nice radiation and you know, and suppression of both the transverse magnetic modes and the transverse electric modes. Now that's good. Uh, so it comes from a, so you want to synthesize the surface current uh, for the 300 gigahertz phase array. Now the question is, well, um, how do I have traveling wave surface currents? I mean, how, how do I realize an antenna? Typical antennas are not traveling wave uh, antennas that, you know, uh, go in loops. Um, and so we were basically thinking about how do I realize that? And then we came across this circuit and now I'll just explain the circuit a little bit. So. Forget the details here. You basically have cross-couple transistors distributed on a loop. Um, now, as a result of the cross-couple nature of it, if I just put a bias on this structure, the following thing happens. The, the length of the loop is lambda by 2 at 150 gigahertz. So what happens that one, if, if you just put DC power, a traveling wave oscillation builds on it, and the two loops, the two sides of the loops behave like a differential transmission line. And so you can see that it's basically 0 and 180, 135 and 315, and it's basically you have a traveling wave um, oscillation builds up on it where the two loops behave like a differential transmission line, completing 180 degree in one loop. But as the 150 gigahertz wave is traveling, which is below F max, um, there is harmonic power being generated above F max. 
And so, for example, the second harmonic power, because the fundamental was differential, the second harmonic would be in phase. So if it's zero and one, it will be zero and zero. And so you see that now you have a traveling wave oscillation at 300 gigahertz, which is exactly what the kind of surface wave we wanted to synthesize in the first place. But what is interesting about this structure, this is the same loop that behaves like a, you know, a resonator, a differential transmitter, a transmission line at the fundamental starts behaving like a traveling at 300 gigahertz. Uh, but this is uh, sort of co-designed with the circuits in a way that converts DC to filter terahertz in one structure, right? So DC gets converted to traveling wave oscillation 150. The differential transmission line suppresses that radiation because it's the, the currents cancel each other radiation. But it's also a harmonic generation in a distributed fashion and also a selective harmonic radiator. So you basically convert a DC to 300 gigahertz filtered signal in one structure through this co-design. And so once you have one structure, you can lock it to multiple structures, so you can make a phased array out of it. Um, and in this particular case, the whole chip um, is you know, 2.7 millimeter by 2.7 millimeters. This was 45 nanometer SOI. Um, everything else is digital control. So you can, you know, we got a large EIRP, uh, 10 milliwatt at 280. It was a record at the time, and now it is even higher. Um, and now you have electronic beam scan, right? Um, but all of these individual arrays that you see here are converting DC to terahertz um, directly in one structure. Uh, this was a recent work uh, last year in ISSC where we you know, enhanced um, the beamforming up to 416 gigahertz CMOS beamforming array with 25 milliwatt EIRP. And the idea there was the following. We basically have multiple independent uh, oscillators. Uh, and then we sort of injection lock them mutually um, uh, through an interesting architecture. It's not a classical mutual lock injection lock, uh, oscillator, but sort of influenced by the idea of mutual locking through a non-linear interaction. Like you see in a metronome, if you have multiple frequencies, you put on a wooden table. If it moves a little bit, they'll all synchronize in frequency and phase. And so does this chip. Um, here. So as you can see that if the you know the synchronization is on, you have this red line. If it's off, you have multiple tones. So basically they're all synchronized in frequency and phase. And then we started thinking about if I can do one frequency, you can do multiple frequencies. And so the idea of this was the following. We wanted to create arbitrary waveforms of terahertz radiation in space, which means that if I could, I could program continuous frequencies. And then if I wanted, if I, I could change this to a broadband pulse. So here, what we did was we have multiple sources. All of them are generating harmonic waves. And by controlling the delay of each wave as they quasi-optically combine, you can sort of reconfigure the time domain waveform in space or the spectrum in space. Right? So if I wanted to create a pulse, I can create a pulse in space in a one direction. If I wanted to create a, a you know, harmonic wave, I can sort of cancel the other harmonics and create a harmonic wave in this case. So it was essentially creating arbitrary periodic waveforms uh, in space. Um, and, and, um, and so if that was spectrum control, we also wanted to look at you know, sort of near field control. And this was a recent work that came out in Nature Electronics uh, very soon. And what, what it does is basically has a programmable meta surface with silicon tiles. And what we did was we have CMOS chips, and I'll show you what individually they are. And this is a meta surface, right? This has no power. So it's meta surface passive with programmability. And we take one chip and we basically make as a Lego block, you can make larger scale surfaces. And so what's the point of metasurface? You know, there's a lot of work in photonics and metasurfaces, right? I mean, you can make flat lenses um, that's really taking off. But in radio frequencies, microwave and terror, there are other applications. Uh, computational imaging is one example, um, uh, as also for communication. So you can imagine that you have links and you can have reflective surfaces that if your link is blocked, you can divert the link and, and close it again. And so there's many, many applications of reflecting surfaces which are passive, which may not have amplification, but can create sort of interesting beam formation uh, through just reflection and through scattering. 
And if you have programmability, then you have uh, the, the other degree, right? So how do we do programmable metasurfaces here? And so this is a chip that you can see. Each element in the chip looks like a almost like a flower. Uh, and what it does is the following. Through different combinations of the switches, it emulates different scattering structures. So for example, if these switches are on, it emulates a C-shaped structure. Now, if you change the nature of the switches, it basically emulates a rotated C-shaped structure. And by controlling the different sort of digital conditions, you can actually rotate the aperture opening or you can widen the aperture opening. Rotating the aperture opening controls the amplitude Widening the aperture opening controls the phase. So you have independent amplitude and phase control um, at these frequencies. Now, why does it look like a flower? Is because your transistors don't work at these frequencies like a switch. This is 300 gigahertz. Your transistor is not a switch at gigahertz. So a classical meta element is not going to work. So what we did was a circuit coupled meta element structure. And while individually each meta element is resonant with the frequency 300 gigahertz, you also have sub-wavelength resonances happening over distributed on each meta element itself. That cancels the parasitic capacitance of, of the transistor, and that makes it work. So you can see that in the amplitude and phase coverage, you have pretty large coverage of phase, around 270 degrees, and you have 25 dB of amplitude control. So it's basically a holographic projector, if you, if you will. So now what you can do is you can have an incident field, you can control the nature of the scattering surfaces, and you can create multiple beams that can scan in space electronically without any power. But you can also create holographic uh, projections. So here on the right-hand side is a measurement. We wanted to basically write Princeton University P and U. Um, and this is a measure result at 300 gigahertz, right? So you create the near field on the meta surface that allows the Fresnel zone projection at that given distance that you want, right? So this was just to show that you have both amplitude and phase control here as well, but there are other interesting applications here. And then what this, this is another work where we basically started thinking about if I could control spectrum against space, what else can you do? Uh, we showed beam forming, which is spatial control. We showed meta surfaces, which is near field control. Uh, and we showed that we can control in, you know, with spectrum with space. And this is a similar idea where we wanted to control spectrum across different space for security. Uh, and the idea is the following. If I have a phased array, and not go into details of this architecture, but the idea of special temporal control um, uh, to create security, is the idea that if I have a Alice and a Bob communication link, and if I have a phased array that, that does that, then Eve, located at a side lobe, would get exactly the same um, spectrum and the same constellation except low SNR. And so the idea there was, if I wanted to obfuscate Eve's connectivity, um, can I imagine creating a channel to Eve which almost looks like time varying? And if you could do that, then what happens is the Bob receives exactly the same spectrum, exactly the same SNR, but an eavesdropper receives garbled spectrum with spectrum aliasing. So the idea is that Eve, being sitting in one of the side lobes, would receive constellation as you see here, and it would make it harder to um, break into the channel. And why is this important? Um, what you know, if you have cryptography, um, that's fine. If your channel is already encrypted, but the idea is that you know, physical layer security techniques are how to exploit the physics of wave propagation to incorporate security in itself. And because of low latency connectivity, you know, people are very excited about physical layer techniques on addition as an additional layer. Uh, on top of um, uh, a, a sort of classical encryption here. So this was not exactly a turnout. This was sort of classical millimeter wave frequency, 71, 76 gigahertz. Um, let me show you the, you know, you can see the chip here. Oh, Some of the animation are working, but anyway. So we had two element array and four element array. Um, and I'll show you this measurement results to show how it works. So Nature Electronics paper is going to come out soon. Um, but what we see here is the following. Um, in a phased array, we can operate this as a, both of the phased array uh, and the secure array. And in a phased array, if I plot the constellation in, in angst angle, you see a QPSK all throughout, right? Uh, and so if Bob is getting a QPSK, Eve is also getting a QPSK. So it's very nice and thorough that way. 
However, the way we do the spatial temporal modulation is that if you look at the constellation in space, you know, Bob receives the ninth constellation that you see here, but Eve constellation is completely garbled. It's not just the constellation is garbled, your spectrum is aliased, and that leads to fundamental loss of information. So what we did in the Nature Electronics paper is that what if you have multiple Eves? What if you have noise from multiple sections of the space? Can you somehow stitch it back together to break the channel? And then we analyze the, the fundamental limits of security uh, from an information theoretic point of view. Um, and, 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 but this is the same idea which can be exploited for something else. So the idea of you can map spectrum to space is again a, a recent work uh, this year at ICC where we created basically an active terahertz prism. And the idea was it's basically a chip that casts different spectrum to different space to create a local GPS. And so you can imagine that if it's in a warehouse, you have multiple robots, um, every block can have its own spectrum. And, and essentially, if I want to create a beam I, between two nodes, I don't have to scan all possible beam configuration. If I know what the local spectrum is, I already know where I am, and it can immediately leads to one-shot localization of multiple wireless nodes. And so we did this uh, with leaky waveguide antennas uh, on chip, um, connected with fully integrated 360 to 420 gigahertz transceivers. Uh, and so this is the simulation of the leaky waveguide antenna. As you see, that that's completely on chip itself. And leaky waveguide antenna has you know uh, properties of uh, uh, you know different radiation patterns in, in space itself. Now, uh, so we take one chip, you take two chips, and you can actually do uh, 2D localization. And in this paper, we show that your accuracy is around you know two degrees if your bandwidth is around 20 hertz itself. OK, so what I wanted to show here again is the idea that once you take the radiating surfaces into the chip, uh, lots of interesting innovations can come by looking at how do I control you know, spatial field distribution, spectral field distribution, and polarization distribution, either from the sensor side or the source side. Uh, and the similar you know, sort of uh, approaches can lead to fundamentally different uh, applications. So physical security was also spectrum to space, uh, but it's very different application compared to localization, which is also spectrum to space. Of course, the architectures are very different, but the idea is fundamentally uh, in, a, in a similar in the sense that we are basically trying to create programmable field distribution um, across space for sources or uh, across space for sensors. OK, so I, I just wanted to add a couple of things, and let me just uh, end it, which is the fact that you know, uh, the entire talk was essentially how to overcome limitations of silicon. But you know, can you just make terahertz arrays in silicon right now? Not really. Uh, if you're interested, we calculated uh, in this paper in ICC workshop, which was, can I create a one terahertz phase array, for example, in silicon now? And the answer is no. We cannot. Um, it, it is the power level is insane, and that is not scalable. Um, but 220 gigahertz, 200 gigahertz, 140 gigahertz, you still can at this point. Um, and so there is something which is fundamentally device limited, right? So unless you overcome that limitation, you know, we are not going to be able to scale up to these high frequencies, where I think a 3.5 devices have a lot of um, a role to play to be able to scale that range. You know, for communication side of things, there are many, many challenges. And the first thing is we don't really know the, what the channel looks like. Uh, there's a lot of measurements that's happening here at 140 gigahertz, but really terahertz channels is, is an open field. Uh, and there's a lot of work needed to be able to make communication links uh, operational of 100 gigahertz. So if you don't know the channel, we really don't know what we are to make about. But I, really, the you know the goal here has been you know in our approach has been programmable uh, terahertz systems uh, through this approach of distributed electronics and distributed electromagnetics and the kind of work um, you know approaches that come as a result of this. With that, I will just end by um, saying thank you, everyone, uh, and we'll be happy to answer any questions. But you know, I have to pay my homage to. Uh, you know, JC Bose, who did this, some of this work back in the 1890s. And if you have a chance to go to Calcutta and go to the museum, you should. Um, it's amazing that what kind of work he did and, and how ingenious he was uh, to be able to, you know, build the systems uh, back in 1890s. You know, this 
it's a Jude polarizer. He used uh, railway books for you know uh, creating these polarizers and so on and so forth. There's a lot of interesting work, and you know it's, uh, we have to pay homage uh, to the man it all started, right? Uh, I will acknowledge my sponsors, and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you again. Thank you, Kaushik, for a very interesting talk. And uh, if there are any questions, uh, please unmute yourself and ask, or you can also post it in the chat box. Um, excuse me, I have a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, Professor Professor Gupta, like uh, yeah. in the uh, when you talked about sampling an antenna directly uh, ah. and thus eliminating all the mixers and the rest of the RX chain, um, how how close uh, should two received tones be in frequency for your system to be unable to resolve them? Like yeah, I imagine. Good. Yeah. 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 Great question. So, um, so I give you a couple of numbers here, right? So, what we did is the following. So, you can imagine that um, you have 84 detectors, right? And so, the, ma the maximum information is 84 points, correct? And so, what you can do is the following. So, we were looking at 100 gigahertz to one terahertz, correct? And so, if you want to divide 100 gigahertz to one terahertz, you can, and your resolution is going to be around, you know, 10 gigahertz, correct? Um, and that's one approach. The other approach is um, you sometimes know a little bit about the frequency you want to do. You want to do sense, right? So with that prior information, uh, you can actually reduce the source spaces uh, to much higher uh, resolution. So as an example, um, if I knew there was one frequency, and that's in the paper itself, if I know there was only one frequency, uh, we have the ability to accurately predict the location of the frequency up to 10 megahertz. Um, but, it, but it has to be sparse. Uh, with respect to two tones, um, it's around the range of 100 megahertz. But again, that depends on how long you're averaging out and what kind of algorithms you're using and also which range of frequencies you're looking at. But you know, we are in terms of accuracy prediction of the frequency, it's, it's around 10 megahertz uh, that you can do. But you also have to know which range of where the 10 megahertz lies prior, right? because all you have is 84 different states. Does this make sense? Yes, thank you. I have another question. Yeah. So, um, so in bands like E-band, they're unlicensed, of course, but then you have strict regulations about beam width, right? Like two degrees or yeah. three degrees beam width. Uh, since now you can have an entire antenna array inside a chip, can you achieve almost arbitrarily thin beams? No, not really, right? Because um, you, you should not want... Um, so arbitrarily thin beams is fundamentally dependent upon the aperture, right? How many elements there are. Um, and so if you're thinking about, uh, you know, if you're thinking about 100 element arrays or 250 element arrays, uh, the approach should not be to put the 250 element arrays uh, inside in one chip uh, because uh, of power dissipation. Um, so people have looked into what is the right size of an array, and then you know there are different approaches. But you know typically a uh, eight to 16 element array uh, with antennas are you know possible. E band is a, probably a little too lower frequency where you want to create antennas on chip because the antenna sizes are not that small. Um, and so uh, even with packaged antennas and uh, with the back end silicon, you know, you don't want to put like 250 element array because the chip is going to be too big, firstly. And but more than that, you know, uh, and there are fundamental limitations when the chip becomes too big. Just getting power to the center part of the chip is, is, is challenging. And so the idea is that, you know, you probably want to break up into sub arrays uh, and that, you know, uh, there's not a clear idea of what's the right element here, but you know, typically eight to sixteen element is is what people have been looking at. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Kushik Vinay here. Oh hi, Dr. Vinay. So yes. uh, just a small uh, question: How much? So if the electronics are now integrated, you're uh, only looking at the millimeter wave front end or like also bringing in uh, some of the other, uh, you know, sensing electronics or some of the other things into it? Well, I mean, uh, so for most of this work, um, 
the entire entire electronics integrated till the till the IF or till the baseband. So what we do not integrate here is the ADC. Uh, but you know, for the different uh, works that we talked about, um, you know, the front end. Um, well, I didn't talk too much about classical transceivers, but in the millimeter wave that we do classical transceivers, we have the you know LNA mixer, IF amplifier. I mean, that's that's uh, you can integrate everything uh, up to that point. Um, we don't integrate the ADCs um, uh, with the chip, but it's doable. Uh, but it's not clear that ADC technology node should be the same node as the front end electronics. But in our work, we integrate everything till the IF or the baseband. And these are done in the same. Uh, whatever we are doing currently, all are done in the same. Uh, let's say same uh, day. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. All of them are die in, in the same die, but I mean, um, I mean, not like a SOC or like multi, you know, vertical arrangement or any such things, right? Yeah, correct. So in this particular work, that you know, the antennas are all, all on the same die. It's all on the same chip. Where, but you know, uh, if I if you want to have, I guess, millimeter wave transceivers with lower noise than just silicon ICs you probably want a gallium arsenide front end either for the LNA or the PA. And that's where the vertical integration comes into the picture, right? So where you can have, uh, you know, one silicon IC uh, chip uh, packaged vertically with uh, maybe a gallium, nitri a gallium arsenide or a gallium nitride, depending on the power level there. And so that can, that's the kind of heterogeneous packaging, which, which is very interesting at these frequencies as well. Which, but we haven't done that. Thank you. Though we have fabricated in a phosphide chips, and that, that was interesting. <laughs> OK, any other questions? Um, Kaushik, Gaurav here. Um, Hi, Gaurav. Just, uh, um, just a couple of questions. Uh, one was related to the, the VCO, so a very intriguing idea that you know you take the second harmonic and uh, spatially combine uh, the second harmonic to reinforce while the, fund the, f the fundamental cancels out. and. Mm -hmm. uh, so two questions related to that. One is, uh, you know, since you talked about large fractional bandwidth systems, we know that this is a, going to be probably a very tuned approach, right? So uh, how would you see that across a large fractional bandwidth system? And for the same oscillator design, uh, since now you're getting into terahertz, we know that as we go from sub six gigahertz to millimeter wave, we have a significant degradation in the phase noise. Now, yeah. uh, if you have to make meaningful use of uh, these oscillators, you also need to look at the phase noise uh, content. So how do you see that challenge being addressed in this context? Yeah, so this was, uh, this was a tuned system, as you rightly pointed out. Um, and and uh, well, the tunability is similar to other VCO tunability, right? So here, if you think about it, what we did here was you have a 94 gigahertz uh, you know, frequency synthesizer um, that is locked uh, to the 280 gigahertz uh, transmitter, right? So um, you know the phase noise, at least within the uh, in the locking PLL bandwidth, uh, would be determined by the low frequency source. But you're correct. I mean, in the, the phase noise um, at these higher frequencies is a challenge, um, and uh, you know there are. Uh, at the end of the day, it's fundamentally limited by you know sort of F max and power dissipation and and so on and so forth, right? So, um, and that would be a, a, a challenge going forward. Now the question. See that that is sort of determined by application. Um, it's not clear that those would be as stringent as some of the sub six gigahertz work, or even in the it's sort of lower millimeter wave frequency work. And since you know the um, you know channel bandwidths and, and so on and so forth are not even defined at these frequencies, uh, you know they, they should be taken into consideration. You know, thinking about phase noise, you know lowering phase noise at these frequencies. But at the end of the day, if you think about it, it is partly device limited, right? Um, and so there is you know sort of you know really serious challenges to create very low noise um, oscillators um, at these frequencies. OK, so I, I thank you. Uh, I had a second question about your yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, spectroscope. I'm calling it yeah, a spectro yeah. <laughs> yeah. spectroscope. So very, yeah. again, very intriguing idea. I really like it. 
uh, I see that you're pushing the the in a conventional spectroscope. Of course, you know uh, you know you would follow the mixed down approach, which which would be like what a spectrum analyzer does, multiple yeah, yeah. super channels in parallel. You're replacing that with uh, computation of the fields, and so uh, the question is. How much of a uh, computational overhead do you have as a result of that? Uh, if you have to make a practical system, um, would that be uh, you know uh, very heavy so that it would become impractical, or uh, is it something that's manageable with current processors and things like that? Yeah, uh, great question. And uh, this computation is not that heavy, right? I mean, basically you have you're basically solving a linear system of equation, not even like a complex you know nonlinear neural network. Right, so we don't even apply. I mean, potentially we could have applied, you know, some kind of learning techniques there, but um, uh, but this was completely deterministic in in one sense, right? You basically know the one side of the linear estimator, you just figure out the other side. But we did use the regularizer to be able to suppress, um, you know, uh, noise blowing out uh, as a result of the inversion. And so, you know, uh, these kind of things. Um, you know, are not very computationally uh, intensive. Um, but but the question is, what is, what what would be the right thing to compare? It's just hard to compare um, spectrum analyzer uh, that covers that are large range of frequencies because first of all, you know, in a classical coherent case, your sensitivity would be better than this. Um, but then there is also nothing that can cover that high frequency ranges, right? So yeah, it's just hard to cover. We've been prior, but in terms of the digital computation, you know, this uh, this is just a linear system equation, so it, it is not that you know computation intensive. We did it, you know, we didn't you know design a processor for this, but we just did it with a CPU. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, excuse me. Could I yeah. could I just follow up with what yeah, Dr. Yeah. energy had? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, uh, could you just uh, tell us again w uh, exactly what is being solved by that estimator? Is it oh, just okay. a so, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so your incidence uh, spectrum is uh, periodic, right? Which essentially means your spectrum is, um, you, you don't have a continuous spectrum. Um, and you know your repetition frequencies, correct? And so your unknowns are the uh, magnitude of each individual harmonic. So it's A1 to AM, for example, if you have M harmonics, right? The sensor response are the 84 sensors that you have. And they're connected by this matrix that you know. So here, you know, the green is the known, is basically the measurement result. A1s are the unknowns, and the responsive matrix is known. Uh, so you're basically solving um, a sort of inverse problem, if you will, right? So here, EF is unknown. This matrix is known, and SRF is known. Of course, okay. in addition to the sensors, you have noise. And as a result of this noise, you have you know, estimation errors. And so that's the one that you have to be careful about. OK, OK. So uh, the t times are not uh, computed as such, correct? The which one? The phase. Oh, yeah, 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 good question. So the, yeah, you're not estimating the phase here. Um, you're not estimating the phase because the detectors are non-coherent. However, um, since you bring it up, I'll, I'll also mention that even with non-coherent detectors, you can estimate the phase in a following way. If you did um, have a control on the non-linearity of detectors, here what I've shown here is that detectors are square law, and if you did a square law of this, you would see that all the harmonics sort of separate out. However, if you had a cube, for example, cube non-linearity, then you would see that those things are coupled. And so what we showed in the paper as actually is interesting, which is first you can estimate the magnitudes by sort of putting the detector, which is dominantly square wave. And that depends on where you, how you bias your detector. So if it's a dominant square wave, you have, z you have no idea what the phase is. So you can get the magnitude from it. Then by playing the um, sort of the region of operation of the nonlinearity, where you can sort of enhance, sort of include cube law, cubic uh, nonlinearity and the power to the power of five, you get phase terms here. And if if you don't have too many frequency components, there are ways of actually extracting the phase information as well. For example, you know, in light waves, right? I mean, in optical frequencies where you, you do not have a mixer uh, in a traditional sense, you can get phase inf information if you have if you measure across multiple distances. 
uh, right? There are Gerber sectional algorithms, for example. Um, and so here we don't do measure across multiple you know angles of incidence or so on and so forth, but we do across multiple nonlinear regions of operation where you get a little bit of phase information if your frequency co content is not very rich. Okay, okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay, any other questions? Okay, looks like there are no other questions. So, uh, let's take this opportunity to also thank uh, Professor Kaushik for uh, taking uh, a time uh, early in the morning for him to give this uh, wonderful talk. And uh, we look forward to hosting you in person sometime soon when this uh, pandemic is behind us. And I would also like to thank all the audience for uh, uh, sitting and uh, listening to this very interesting talk. And uh, I hope to see you soon in the next webinar. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the hosting. And again, appreciate uh, it's a Friday evening, so I appreciate you hanging in there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.